Peter, thank you so much for reading that. Really appreciate that. I've called today's uh, sermon as we reflect on scripture here, Making Sense of the Census. Uh, Eric was very, very wise in his eldership role to advise against me calling it How to Make the Census Sound Sexy. So we're going to call it Making Sense of the Sex... Uh, the sex <laughs> forgive me. Making Sense of the, of the Census. Luke 2, as it has been read will tap into something else in the Old Testament. Now, without your car, I wonder how far you'd be willing to go back to your hometown. Now, I'd have to go to Coventry, so please, no sarcastic comments. But imagine going on donkey back with a pregnant wife, a heavily pregnant wife. I want to say no thank you. I wonder what Joseph and Mary thought when they had to go from Nazareth in the north to Bethlehem in the south. That is some trek. It's hard at going in a coach, never mind on a donkey. I suspect that for me, I get more cross when, when I can't find a car, spa a car space in Sainsbury's or some such place than they would get as cross going south on a donkey. If God can't get me that parking space, how on earth can God be in charge of everything? Well, as we know, God is in charge of everything. Thank God. Thank you, Lord, for being in charge of everything. Whether I get my poxy little car space or not. And God is in charge, even if the birth of the saviour of the world is imminent. And it looks ropey. And it's dangerous and difficult and problematic. God is in charge. When Luke writes this chapter that I know is so familiar to us all. He's telling us in subtle ways two competing stories, two ways of seeing the world, two ways of seeing the way things really are. Because it looks like Caesar is in control, right? Luke is locating us in history at a particular point in time and telling us the most powerful man in the world Caesar Augustus is named in the first verse of chapter 2. The whole world will be registered. This is the most powerful man getting his will done. The whole world will be registered. He will take a census. Everybody will be counted. King Caesar declares what will be. He has an empire to run, an, an army to, to, to feed. He has borders to protect and supplies to guarantee. So to declare a census in this sense in the ancient world is uniquely characteristic of those who wield power. Now, in the ancient world, to do this is to, uh, is, is to enact a supreme act of domination on the part of a tyrannical king. This is a form of administrative tyranny, <laughs> which proves that mere paperwork can be very dangerous. We know that worldly powers are deeply concerned with the indoctrination of fear to assert control over a population. Every system of domination, political or cultural tyranny, is predicated upon the fear of punishment. The fear of ostracization, the fear of torture, and, of course, ultimately, the fear of death. And because the weak, the majority, can be so often cowed by the strong, the minority, the powerful remain in power in a kind of strange, dysfunctional equilibrium, where it's kind of maintaining itself. Then there's the Holy Family. Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. Not even a grubby Bethlehem Inn, Bethlehem Inn could take them. They went lower than all into what seems to be a barn or some kind of stable place. The contrast between King Caesar and King Jesus could not be greater, could not be more stark. One speaks of power and domination and coercion. The other of sacrificial saving love and then Luke drops in what we all know verse 4 he says Joseph went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth to the city of David called Bethlehem 
because he was of the house and lineage of David. And we're supposed to go, oh yeah, this baby's from the line of David. Oh yeah, Israel's greatest king. Yeah, the, the, the archetype king, the ideal king in the Old Testament. And we're supposed to go, yes, Luke, I get you now. I see what you're saying now. I see what you're doing, Lukey, old boy. Thank you for dropping in that he's from the house and lineage of David. You're trying to remind us of that other census in the Bible. That other census. You know, that wicked census conducted by a king who had turned tyrannical and refused to trust God in his latter years. That's right, it's King David himself. When we read that verse in verse 4, we're supposed to go, Oh, I get you. Thank you, Luke. You've pointed me on to something now about this census. This takes us into 2 Samuel 24, which we, unfortunately, very tragically, we don't have time to read. Read it later uh, if you are not familiar with it. It is a brief and tragic tale of King David's ill-advised venture to conduct a census. David takes a census at the end of all these campaigns when there's relative peace against God's uh, permission to do so, which God had not given. And in doing so, David betrays a, a demonically alarming lack of trust. A demonically alarming lack of trust. Chronicles informs us that it was Satan that incited David to do it. In Chronicles, it was God. Trust and faith with loyalty and devotion are always the marks of the people of God and had often characterised David's life as opposed to a, a breach of covenantal obedience through willful rebellion. Trust in God is always the key to success and joy, church. Trouble will always come when individuals or nations or churches or rulers try to seize the reins of power. What is this? This is the failure of the third temptation of Jesus, is it not? Remember, gaining power illegitimately is what all of this is about. When we want to fend for ourselves and make our own arrangements and plans or force the issues through, without God's permission or say so. This is what's going on here in 2 Samuel 24. This is what King David was doing, furiously and meticulously counting his people with the determination of his younger self, who pulled every string, just as he did in order to get Bathsheba into his bed and her husband into his grave. In the biblical worldview... This is what Luke is showing us. The census is the device of mistrust, wickedness, and evil. Now, I know that some of you will be thinking, probably, maybe not. But Richard, it's only for counting people and resources and taxation. Well, you could say that in the same way that the Nazi guards at Belsen and Auschwitz were only following orders. Wickedness can take such banal, bureaucratic processes. The Bible itself exposes what is really going on as sin and folly. So when we read of King Caesar's census, we are forced to remember King David's census. Caesar had the biggest army in the world. David wanted to try his own way of protecting his own nation and himself without God's ways. Recall Gideon. We remember what happened to his big army. He had 22,000 men and God whittled it down to 300. Madness in the eyes of the world. But yet again, it's that great biblical reversal, isn't it? God will show us what it means to trust him and it is not by the processes that the world uses. It just is not. God's people are always called to trust and to not count. And this David and Caesar example point us back, of course, to the first sin of Adam and Eve. 
taking something that God did not offer. This is the failure of the first temptation of Jesus, snatching at provision when God has not given permission to do so. And that can be seen in all manner of ways. Power and control over God seems to be the thing that human beings are simply majestic at doing. That's why we need a saviour. Christ is the great reset that humanity has always needed. But we find him now in an animal feeding trough. The one who is food for the world is now in the, in the place where animals feed. Wrapped up in swaddling cloths, bound, but in him is ultimate freedom, ultimate salvation. And did you know David's census took nine months? The time it takes to make a baby? He wanted to survey the whole country, just as he had surveyed Bathsheba from his rooftop. As with the Bathsheba sin, as is typical of David, and this is one of the things that irritates me about him, he, he sins greatly, as we do too, but he repents quickly too when it's pointed out. As with Nathan and Bathsheba, so with the census and the prophet Gad. Because he was a real man like us, a real woman, <laughs> he was a real person like us. Sinning often, he repented quickly, not using the speed of his repentance for the reason to keep on sinning as a kind of psychological trick, which Paul picks up on. Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may abound? No, he says. We don't keep on sinning so that we can keep experiencing grace, but we're trained out of sin. That's the Christian life, a training in righteousness out of sin, out of unrighteousness. That's why the, 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 the early church father, St. Ambrose, commenting on this said, he said, it's not strange that people sin. We should never be surprised that people sin. Never be shocked either. Sin is often so banal and so boring in any case. So we should never be surprised that people sin. It's not strange that people sin, he said, but it is reprehensible if they do not acknowledge that they have erred and humble themselves before God. Hence, the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Repent, the invitation to align yourself with God's ways. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So what's the outcome of verse 20, uh, of 2 Samuel 24? Verse 18 is amazing of this. We haven't read it, but David goes to the threshing floor of Ar Ar Aruna, the Jebusite. I can't believe it. These Gentiles just get everywhere, don't they? He buys a place from this, this character, Aruna from which Solomon would go on in the next generation to build the wonder of the world, the, the Jerusalem temple. David buys the land off him and animals and then offers sacrifice according to the Mosaic law on that land. Okay, hold all of that. What does that mean? The threshing floor where David goes after he repents and does his census is that special place of sorting out, of judging, of separating. The place where evil is finally separated from the good. Where evil is separated and blown away in the wind. It's a beautiful picture of what God does. How he separates what is destructive and evil and wicked. And this is precisely what the temple sacrificial system would be about. Okay, so as we finish, the reason why Luke mentions the census is because he wants us to make these links. David's prayer in 2 Samuel 14, when he repents after he is confronted with the prophet Gad, he says this, David said to Gad, I am in great distress. And then he prays, and this is our prayer too. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord. For his mercy is great. But do not let me, do not let us fall into the hand of man. Why? Because 
Our wickedness is great. Our revenge is great. Our sin is great. Let us fall into the hands of God for his mercy is great. So David's prayer here anticipates two things that I'm going to finish with. The sacrificial attitude that Isaiah will write of concerning the suffering servant that we began our service with. This servant who will not even break a bruised reed. Oh. And secondly, the sacrificial death of the son himself. He is the lamb and the lion. The temple is the place where God and humanity, heaven and earth, meet in sanctifying grace, where right worship is offered, right praise is offered. Is all now to be found in this new son of David that Luke talks about, where humanity and divinity meet in rightly ordered worship, right praise of the Holy One. And the link is obvious for the readers of Luke's Gospel. Caesar is Lord in the crazy, tyrannical sense of the, of the term, but Jesus is Lord in the self-sacrificial, sin-forgiving, atoning, divine sense of the word. Luke is simply setting the scene for us. That real power does not come from a protection of the ego, from all sorts of danger, but rather a willingness to expose the ego for the sake of love, to expose the ego to danger for the sake of love. And this is what Advent is about. Making sense of Caesar's census. Caesar's will was being carried out, and in so doing, the Saviour was in the place to begin doing the Father's will. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. Verse 6 says, while they were there, the time came, <laughs> the time came for the baby to be born. In those days, as in ours, the time has come for Christ to be born in every human heart. Father, we give you thanks for your word, for the truth and the clarity with which it speaks. We pray, Lord, that we will not be beguiled by ways that seem so ordinary, yet sinful, Father. That you will, Lord, once again be born in our hearts today as we celebrate Christ, the one born in God's time to do God's will, to redeem God's people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.